Good morning. Family of faith, welcome to Summit Avenue, Presbyterian, in person and online. On this Earth Day weekend, we are reminded of our call to be caretakers and advocates of God's good earth. In our worship today, we will sing of God's good creation and pray for the well-being of all God's creation. We begin our service today by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is part of the aboriginal territory of the Sequabs, people of clear salt water, Sequamish people, expert fishermen, canoe builders, and basket weavers. The Sequabs live in harmony with the land and waterways along Washington's central Sal Sal Salish Sea as they have for thousands of years. Here the Sequabs live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations as promised, the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. Friends, let us worship our Holy Creator. Please join me in our call to worship. Please stand. Church, where do you see God? We see God in the wide reach of sky, in the towering height of mountains, in the depths of the sea, and in the vividness of flowers. Church, where else do you see God? We see God in early morning sunrises, in the quiet after a snow, in the reaching of rivers and tributaries, and in the stars that light the night. And in your seeing, what do you know? We know it is here, and we know that God is good. Let us worship the God of creation. Let us worship our with us God. Scripture reading is from Deuteronomy 30, 15, 20. 
See, I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience in him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. First of all, kudos to the green team. Um, they are headed up by Zoe Peak and Carl Jensen, and they spearheaded a cleanup of our little Lake Forest Park on South Summit Avenue, which is, well, anyway, it's only about two blocks from here. It's a darling little park. And several of us spent the morning pulling out invasive weeds and picking up trash. And now we're all achy. <laughs> um, on this Earth Day weekend, we remember the abundance and generosity of the earth to provide enough food for all living creatures. But sadly, we know that this is not always the case. And part of Summit Avenue's mission is to seek justice by working to change systems that hold people in poverty. Here at church, we have our own little neighborhood pantry, and we collect food donations for it each week during worship. And I actually know, I met at the community dinner about a month ago, a couple of people who visit that little pantry every day. Our SOS team <clears throat> has its next community dinner this Thursday at 5.30, and it's a Mexican food theme, and you are welcome to come in and share in the meal or to help host. You meet some fun people there. And through your generous donations to the Deacon's Fund, uh, it helps support three local charities, the Bremerton Food Line, St. Vincent de Paul, and the Salvation Army. And last spring, a member of St. Vincent de Paul was here talking about their mission. And this week, we have a member from the Salvation Army. To date, we have raised $450, a little over that, to the mission of the Salvation Army here, and we hope to raise more. A group of us, uh, deacons and Pastor Susie, visited the Salvation Army a, a while back, and I was, again, absolutely godsmacked by the services they provide and the depth of their um, commitment to the vulnerable in our community. So would you please welcome Captain Dana Walters, who is here to tell you more about what they do. I'm really glad you have a step right here because you would only be seeing my eyes. I want to, first of all, put this little bell here because if I don't, I will forget. At the end of service, I have a little bell for everybody, so I'll be in the foyer passing that out. So uh, that's my reminder. So, Well, thank you so much for, for inviting me to come here. And um, where is the screen? Okay. Right there. There's one. Okay. So... Salvation Army. So I wanted just to, to begin with a scripture, and um, so many things change in your life, right, as time goes on, and um, during different times in my life, there's been during script different scriptures that have really ministered to me, and this is one that I have really found since being a Salvation Army officer and engaged in the work that we do. Um, this is a prayer. The sovereign, sovereign Lord, I'm sorry, we're in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 4. The sovereign Lord has given me a well-instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wake, wakes my ear to listen like one being instructed. 
I just pray that when I wake up, I would hear his voice and that I would have the word that would sustain the weary. We are surrounded by weary people, right? Not just me, but everyone. Our whole world is weary in so many ways. I wanted to share with you some of the things that we do, and um, we are a busy people, and I can't even thank you enough for your support uh, for the work that we do. We just sincerely appreciate every penny that comes in, and um, it just is such a blessing, and we're able to do uh, so much. So, as a faith-based organization, uh, our work is motivated by our love for God and his people, and it's really a privilege to care and to love all people in our community. And I can tell you there's a time in my life when I wouldn't have said that. Um, I was raised with, you know, my, my daddy was, we worked hard, and if you didn't, you needed to just pull up your bootstraps and get on with it and suck it up and do it. And uh, so that was kind of how I always grew up, and then... As I became a Salvation Army officer, I realized that there are people who, one, don't have boots, two, don't know what a bootstrap is, and wouldn't know how to pull it up, and once they got the boot on, wouldn't know what to do, right? I've had that modeled for me my whole life by people who had boots, knew what a bootstrap was, and knew what to do when they got it on. And so my heart has been changed into beginning to understand uh, how it is that people are different and why it is that they do the things that they do. Um, we have a saying that's posted all over our building, and it says, be careful in judging people for the choices they make when we don't know the options they had to choose from, right? We have a woman in our uh, facility who uh, was uh, consistently uh, molested. She was sold for drugs at a very young age. And so why would she not grow up to be a drug addict? Right? Well, what are the odds? Yeah, so I have to be careful to say, I don't know what options you had to choose from, which is why what makes you do what you do. Um, but what I do know is that I get to love you in Christ's name. Amen? So as you might be aware, we hosted an emergency COVID shelter for over three years. We generally host a winter shelter from November through March. And so in 2019, March, the governor said, stay home and stay safe. And there was a lot of people who didn't have a home. So the county and the city said to us, would you mind providing continuing shelter uh, and, and adding a day component? So we went into a 24 seven, three meals a day, seven days a week, and we lost half of our staff in one day because people were immunocompromised, pregnant, on you know, all these things. So we were doing, uh, man, I've done a lot of one in the morning till 9 a.m. shifts and uh, that sort of thing, but, uh, but we did it. And you know, everybody said, oh, it'll just be a month. Mm, then it was a three-month contract. Then it was a six-month contract. Three and a half years later, we finally closed the emergency shelter in April of last year. And we all know what that looked like, but we'll get there. So a bed night is, so let's say that tonight 70 people come and stay, and then tomorrow night 70 people come, so that would be 140 bed nights. So over the period of those three years, we provided almost 59,000 bed nights, and we had over 65,000 people who came and stayed during the day and hung out at our shelter. Uh, over 230,000 meals provided. Um, one of the coolest things we have is our hygiene center. And um, to me, it's the heartbeat of what we do. Uh, we have people who come in who have not showered for an extremely long time. And um, to be able to see them get clean and put on clean clothes and see that dignity that it brings them, that's just that's just life changing. That's just life changing. I don't know if you've ever been camping and been outside for a week or two and you come home and boy, you're looking forward to that shower and some clean clothes and so do they. So we also do laundry for our guests. So um, we, uh, we don't have a laundry facility where they can come in and do it, we do it for them. So over those three and a half years, we provided um, over 7,000 and 600 loads of laundry. And that's just for the guests. That doesn't include all the towels and sheets and pillowcases and blankets and, um, and as well over 13,000 showers. 
And we are a pet-friendly shelter. So um, a lot of people will not come in and stay if they can't bring their pets. They would rather sleep in the cold, right? So um, we uh, love having people's pets. We have an area that's designated for people with pets. And um, we get to know them, and we, we cry, and we, we rejoice about the pets and, and all those things. And um, so we provided over 40, uh, 100 bed nights for pets. But um, probably the thing that has been the most unusual is we've had um, birds, we've had rabbits, possums, um, uh, ducks, uh, cats and dogs. Um, <clears throat> the oddest one was a dead crab. And it was one of our guests who has a lot of mental health and she found the crab and she put it in a box. So we said, oh, lovely. And two days later, we said, you know, I think the crab has passed. So we were able to bury the crab, but, you know, the crab stayed with us. So, um, so it's a privilege to be able to house people's pets as well. Right now, we have about 18 pets that are staying with us every night. We had to move the, to a bigger area. <clears throat> so, so what are we doing now that we, the shelter, um, <clears throat> the emergency shelter closed? Well, we do what every church does. We bought a bar. Not kidding. We bought the Monica Social Club, which is right next door to the Salvation Army. The day that Captain Lance and I came to Bremerton five years ago, um, we drove in the parking lot and we said, we gotta buy that, <laughs> right? So we have purchased it. Um, it is going to become Shelves of Hope, which is a client choice food pantry. And you know, nothing happens fast. We've, been, we've had it for a year now, of a, as of like, I think March 17th. And, you know, we're still in paperwork, and we're actually going to have to demo the building and just take it down, and I'm waiting to drive the bulldozer. Um, but that's coming up as uh, we'll be building that, um, that building into a client choice food pantry. And client choice means people get to come in and shop for what they need. Um, so right now we're providing food boxes to people, so we do have that open uh, in the afternoons uh, twice a week. So, of course, we started again with our winter shelter in November, and it's 24-7, low barrier, pet-friendly, drop-in. And so what does that mean? So low barrier means that anyone can come in. You can be high, you can be intoxicated, you can be a person with a criminal record of any type, um, and you can come in. We don't screen people at the door for what they've done or if they can come in. Um, as long as you can be there and not be violent and hurt anyone else, then if that happens, you become ineligible for services. And sometimes that's for 24 hours, sometimes it's permanently. But my husband will always say there's always hope. I can't tell you how many people he brings back in because he, you know, works with them and everything. So. And a drop-in shelter means that you don't have to have a um, reservation. Some of the, all of the other shelters here, you have to be pre-screened and have a reservation to get in. So ours is just drop-in, whoever uh, wants to come. So it can be quite difficult. There are days when, when our staff is just like, and we have 24-7 security because many of our guests struggle with being able to be in an environment with other people, right, when you're not used to that. And um, so that's, that's important. So the shelter is going to remain open until a permanent low barrier shelter is built or funds run out. I don't know which one's going to happen first. I'm just hanging on for, please, God, let it be done by May of um, spring of 2025 that the county and the city will finish a, a, uh, a permanent uh, shelter. And we talk consistently with them both. And uh, so we are just uh, sur supporting whatever they're doing in that. We also continue to provide utility assistance, bus tokens, uh, ooh, skip, gas vouchers, motel vouchers, identification assistance. Do you know what it's like to not have an ID? Man, you can't get anything. You can't get housing. You can't get um, you know, assistance from the government. You, so having an identification, which costs $55, can change a life. And so we have a loan, not a loan, a grant from the county, a housing and homeless grant um, that we're able to provide funds for that. And we probably, I'm gonna say $10,000, $12,000 a year 
just on identifications. So such a basic need for people. We do give out backpacks. We have three meals a day along with showers and laundry. Um, we host weekly AA and NA meetings. We have community rooms for people to use. We provide space for a Stand By Me program and SUD counselors, which would be substance use disorder counselors. So if you're a person who's in addiction and you decide you want to get clean, you have to have an assessment. And you have to do this and you have to do that. And if it doesn't happen quickly, you're probably not going to be successful. So having an SUD counselor on premises is so helpful because we can just get them right into that whole system and, and get that going. And the Stand By Me program just assists and comes alongside uh, people and helps them uh, in that program. That is um, funded by um, Peninsula Community Health Services. And we do Christmas, yay, for kiddos and families. Um, it's always our busiest time of year. In this last Christmas, we provided over thir almost 1,400 toys new shoes, coats, and I'll tell you about the turkeys, but it's really important to us that every child gets a new coat and a new pair of shoes. So we always put that information out there on Angel Tree. And whatever Angel Tree tags may not get taken, we still provide that because we want to make sure that everyone who comes and applies um, gets what they need. This last year, we partnered with St. Vincent de Paul, and I was talking with uh, Felicia over there, and uh, we were talking that they weren't gonna do toys, and I said, well, hey, why don't you guys do food, and we'll do toys and clothes, and we were like, woohoo! So we collaborated, and it was perfect. So we just did all the toys and clothes, and they did all the uh, Christmas box meals, so we gave them 150 turkeys that were donated to us, and it was, it was just a win-win and a beautiful collaboration. We also do summer camp, vacation Bible school, and we do some back to school events um, that are coming up, um, trying to, you know, we don't do a lot of that. And COVID really shut down our youth programs. I don't know about you guys, but you know, it's just really difficult. So we're working on reinstating those. And of course our Sunday church services we have, um, Captain Lance and I are both ordained pastors. We trade off preaching every other week. And whoever is preaching gets to stay home on Friday and study. So it's even more of a bonus. And um, I love preaching. I love studying the word and picking it apart and finding those golden things and sharing them. And it's super fun. Uh, we also have Bible studies. Men's and women's groups are held weekly. And a lot of our guests from our shelter do come. People always ask me that. Do, do they come? And we do have regular people who attend church, um, you know, every week and are, are part of our group. And, uh, and it's wonderful. So thank you again for your support. Um, really appreciate it and just want you to know that we are so thankful um, for people who care about what we care about. I believe that in William Booth who started the Salvation Army, he said soup, soap, and salvation. Soup for the inner man, soap for the outer man, salvation for the spiritual man. And that's really our heart, which I believe follows what Jesus said about clothing and feeding and taking care of people. And you guys are a part of that. You, every day, whatever it is that you're giving is a part of what we're doing there. So when you see those people and they're being, their needs are being met, know that you've made a difference. And that's super important. Thank you so much.
One of the things that is amazing about the earth is that even after a fire, a flood, or an oil spill, new life always finds a way to grow. Friends, God's grace is like that, no matter the mistakes we make, the mess we create, or the harm we do. God's love for us is unending. Trusting in that good news lets us turn to the prayer of confession with confidence that even here, grace is in bloom. Creator God, we have lost our way. In the beginning, God, humanity was instructed to care for creation. However, in pursuit of our own wealth and efficiency, we have done the opposite. The oceans are heavy with plastic, the ice caps are melting by the hour, animals and plants are treated as a means to an end. Corporations fill the atmosphere with pollution. Policies and practices are slow to change. Forgive us, O oh God. Bring us back to the garden. Fill our hearts with compassion for your world. Show us where we can make a difference and help us to see your fingerprints in every glimpse of the new natural world. With hope in our hearts for a better day, we pray. Amen. Sorry, we're off script a little bit today, so. Um, friends, when it comes to creation care, we have a lot to confess. But even here, even now, God's grace for us is like a mighty rushing stream. So trusting in God's unrelenting mercy, may we, we be inspired to action. Join me in proclaiming these words of forgiveness. Just as flowers that bloom after the fire, there is nothing that God cannot redeem. We are known, we are loved, we are made new. So we may roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty with the work of justice, with the work of compassion, with the work of mercy. Thanks be to the God for his new day. Alleluia. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with all of you. Please take a moment to safely share the peace of Christ with those of you around you.
worship today. Oh, please be seated. <laughs> In our worship today, we welcome preacher David Singenthaler. David has a Master of Divinity from Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary in Austin, Texas, and a PhD in Theology from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California. David currently serves as the Regional Program Manager for the Federal Lands in Parks Program of the National Park Service. David's main project is to explore the theologically and ecologically the human role in nature. Hopefully I pronounced your last name correctly. <laughs> um, welcome, David. Yeah, my name is normally butchered, but that was a very, very fine job. Thank you, Siegenthaler. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to be with you here today, and uh, I appreciate it. It's also very, really good to hear about um, some actual real world salvation that's going on that is that is physical uh, a, a real redemption of body mind and soul so um, and i think that'll align with our scripture reading this morning from the new testament this is from the first letter of john chapter 3 verses 16 to 24. listen now for the word of god this is how we know what love is jesus christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in the person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. This we know, we know we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commands us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. The word of the Lord. Please join me in a prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Tomorrow, as everyone knows, is Earth Day. It's the one day of the year when we are focused on the magnificent place we live in, its beauty, its intricacies, and to some extent, to our impacts upon it. It's a time of both celebration and thankfulness, for many a, t a time to give back, to take some action that will benefit the Earth. We heard a little bit about it a little while ago doing litter cleanup, tree planting, trail building, or native plant landscaping. It's also a day to acknowledge, as our confession has today, that we continue to pollute the world with plastics, we have exacerbated climate change, we have spoiled or eliminated habitat, dirtied the air and water, but we don't really need to catalog those things today because um, we hear about them every day, and we know the situation we face is urgent. When we look back, we might imagine the promise and anticipation some of our ancestors had about a vast and verdant landscape that promised wealth and self-determination when they, as immigrants, first came into the promised land of North America. We participate in their dreams as beneficiaries of their actions. Their destiny, they thought, was to possess the land and control it from sea to sea. We now realize that we've not done such a good job of ensuring that its verdancy and rich biota would be sustained into the far future. In a way, we might say, as the Deuteronomist did, that heaven and earth witness against us, that we had a choice between life and death, blessings and curses, and we have not always chosen life. 
we haven't always followed the instructions. So Earth Day helps to bring to mind both the gift of life and the failures related to our care for life. In that, it does us well to keep the tradition of Earth Day year after year. But Earth Day, in a way, is also a symptom of the malady that afflicts us, that of spiritual, of, pardon me, of separation and lack of knowing our proper place in the scheme of things. We've known something about the trouble we cause for a very long time, including climate change. Uh, more than 2,000 years ago, Theophrastus, who was a student of Aristotle, um, noted that swamp drainage and agriculture changed local climates. Similarly, George Perkins Marsh in 1864 studied local climatic effects of different land use practices such as agriculture and logging in his book, Man and Nature. Our environmental movement, including our system of public parks, began as we noticed the rapidity of development and land acquisitions for commercial purposes at least as early as 1835. The first Earth Day was celebrated in April 22, 1970 after a series of environmental disasters. The Presbyterian Church USA, I hope you all know this already, Presbyterian Church USA developed a policy statement at the General Assembly in 1990 called Restoring Creation for Ecology and Justice. It wasn't the first policy statement about ecological concerns put out by the Presbyterian Church, but it was one of the most ambitious designating the 1990s as the turnaround decade and doing so with covenant seriousness. The International Earth Charter was initiated in the 90s as a consensus grassroots document with wide support as a supplement to the United Nations International Declaration on Human Rights. And it still struggles to gain recognition and influence. Especially in the 1970s and 80s, much attention was paid to the development of environmental education programs and materials. But what have we accomplished since then? A fairly recent study revealed that although educational efforts has raised awareness of ecological terms, there's still a wide gap in people's understandings of ecological concepts and how we participate in and are dependent upon ecological processes. My own career has been greatly affected by my sense that the educational approaches to address ecological literacy and affect change behavior were somewhat naive. Having worked in environmental education centers and on curriculum development myself, I came to realize that the objectivity claimed by educators in their attempt to, as they said, teach people not what to think but how to think, was blind to inherent biases with no mechanisms to analyze and identify those biases and it rarely modeled the necessity of making decisions and directly engaging in the issues. I believe it was very mistaken in the assumption that all you need to do is teach people some facts and they will behave appropriately. It completely missed the point that some very intelligent and often well-meaning people who had command of ecological facts could be doing some very damaging things. And as Joseph Sittler put, uh, pointed out, Human beings are quite capable of marching steadily into disaster, fully equipped with the facts. Pride, comfort, and idolatrous, brutal hardness of heart have for several generations permitted the American people, nation, to stare straight in the face of poverty, injustice, and the calcified privilege of the powerful, and leave national priorities unchallenged. I realize that knowledge really has no moral valence um, so I decided I needed to focus more on how people behave and make choices according to what is of ultimate significance and ultimate value to them. That's where theology and faith come in. Trusting the spirits and joining with others in discernment of what God wills for us to be and to do and faith abilities that do not yet exist, latent or hidden, potentialities that others may say are impossible or not practical. I think the Salvation Army <laughs> does that, seeing in people potentiality that others don't see and living into that and realizing it um, against all odds. In the Deuteronomy passage today, we heard special instructions given to Israel 
by Moses just before entering the promised land of Canaan. The bottom line is, obey God's commandments, the first of which is to love God. It is really the main commandment that encompasses all the requirements, but we are informed through Deuteronomy what some of the content of the love is that's required. We are told, share food with the hungry, cancel the debts of the poor that they cannot pay, guard against excessive wealth through good government, share hospitality with runaway slaves, don't charge interest on loans, pay laborers promptly what they have earned, leave the residue of harvest for the disadvantaged, and limit punishment to preserve human dignity, among some other things. What we don't hear, and this is a little bit beside the point, but not, not really beside the point, is how to regard the people who are not of the same tribes, who presently occupy the land that the Hebrew people are about to possess. What about the people who are already there? We might add the requirement, compelled by love, that the integrity and dignity and rights of those who are already there must be honored. And I don't know exactly how that is done by people in a settler colonial mind frame and desperate for a place to live. But we certainly haven't really done the best job of that here. The focus, though, is what one does out of love. I asked this question when I was involved in some very contentious and litigious um, planning efforts in Yosemite National Park. Visitation in parks has escalated tremendously in the past few decades, and the demands for services and access have multiplied. That's a challenge for the National Park Service, whose congressionally mandated mission is to conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects and the wildlife therein, and provide for the enjoyment of the same in such manner and by such means as will leave them unimpaired for the enjoyment of future generations. We hear it said all the time that we are loving our parks to death. And I must admit that I love Yosemite very much. I could say that about North Cascades and Mount Rainier and other places I've lived and worked, but they said it in Yosemite, and, um, and I really feel at home in Yosemite. Uh, Chinoa grew up in a high alpine, subalpine meadow in the, in the northern part of uh, Yosemite Park to a large extent. But I did wonder, how does one love a place and behave in the presence of so many of Yosemite's other lovers? When does love become self-indulgence? What, what does love actually compel us to do? And I was trying to make a distinction between two different kinds of love. The self-indulgent love that is grasping and possessive and sometimes controlling versus the kind of love that is attuned to the needs of the other, that is self-giving. We needed restraint for the sake of the place and the sake of other people's experience of the place. In public meetings and through written comments, we heard a spectrum of views on how to manage the park, but they can be bracketed by two extremes that got a lot of expression. Those who wanted as much commercial services and luxury accommodation as could be squeezed in, on the one hand, with no limits to the numbers of people to come into the park because, of course, all Americans have a right to visit the parks on their own terms. And on the other hand, those who felt that all people do is harm nature, so facilities should be minimal and people should be kept out as much as possible. Sort of an extreme environmentalism. They both went too far in their demands. Neither of them, in my view, recognized fully the true needs and opportunities inherent in the situation or the damage that their views perpetuated. Too much of a built environment that does not honor the fragility of the place, the impacts to the ecological communities and processes on the part of the developers on the one hand, and the lack of recognition on the other hand of the extreme environmentalists that human beings and landscapes actually evolved along with each other. That the so-called pristine nature that was discovered in Yosemite by settlers really not capable of seeing what was actually going on had been lived in and manipulated for thousands of years by the Miwok people and their ancestors, people who were then removed from the land for the sake of pioneer settlement and for the creation of public park. What happens to an ecological community when one of its members is removed, even if one of those members is a human being? 
One of the suggestions I heard in the cacophony of voices during our planning processes was the idea that people should be specially prepared to visit a place like Yosemite so that their visit would have minimal impact and so they would be primed possibly with some natural awareness and observation skills to be fully open and alert to the in intricacies of life and the beauty that were there. What is needed to really orient us to be the respectful, responsible participant that the earth needs us to be? We have tried the selfish dominant dominion role, the one that controls earth to fulfill our personal desires. And we have tried various sort of less selfish versions of dominion, such as being stewards and gardeners and priests. But they all, to varying degrees, perpetuate a separation of human beings from the world and place as in a controlling position. It's time for some other metaphor or some other worldview to guide our sense of who we are called to be in the world. We are called in these scriptural passages from Deuteronomy in 1 John to love and to obey God's commandments. We might mistakenly assume that it is only a matter of obeying orders, mostly an intellectual feat. We just have to get the directions straight. But that's not what either Deuteronomy nor 1 John mean when they say love God and obey God's commandments. In Deuteronomy, we are told that God will circumcise our hearts so that we will love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul in order that we may live. We are told the world is very near to you. It is in your mouth and on your heart to observe. Commandment is more a description of natural response to having experienced God's love. 1 John similarly speaks of the love of God and the care for each other that is natu a natural result of that. I think it is important to note that in this letter, and in all of the New Testament actually, the kind of love that's being called for, the kind that is evoked naturally in response to the love we experience from God and know through Christ's life and self-sacrificial death, is self-giving, self-surrendering love. It is not controlling, self-indulgent, grasping love that is indicated with the Greek word eros. Eros is not even used in the New Testament. And there is a very deliberate distinction between the love, self-giving love, and the Greek word is agape, and eros. It is not a self-indulgent, controlling love. It is a self-giving love. Love is a self-giving love. Agape is what is needed, and it will guide us into the promised land as we take on new form of responsible membership in the earth community, one that incorporates reciprocity with the land and other life, that seeks to restore biotic communities and cultural practices that keep us attuned to the gifts we receive and the gifts we can give in return. It's the love that compels us to respond when we see a sister or brother in need. It is not a sentiment, it's a life aimed by the knowledge and the visceral experience of the love of God. You may recall hearing in Deuteronomy the warning that if your hearts turn away and you do not hear but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall certainly perish. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Let's give up the false gods of consumerism, dependence for salvation through technology, accumulation of excessive wealth, and notions of freedom that are not aimed at the common good. There's a quote that is prevalent in the environmental education field that says, people only say what they love, they only love what they understand, and they only understand what they are taught. As important as teaching is, I think this quote has it completely backwards. We need, to, we need love to guide our quest for understanding. We need first-hand immersion within our ecological communities to develop the deep sense of belonging and wonder. We need skills of watching and waiting. We need experience of place and an orientation more to space than to time. We need love first. Love that we know through our experience of God with us in Christ and God's love experienced from others. And we need to love so that others can experience the spirit of love through us. 
This is how we choose life. I have a high regard for books, and mountains are, I love mountains too, are certainly not the only places to experience the beauty of the earth, as all of the earth is sacred to God's purposes. But John Muir makes a good point when he says, I have a low opinion of books. They are but piles of stone set up to show coming travelers where other minds have been, or at best, signal smokes to call attention. Cadmus and all the other inventors of letters receive a thousandfold more credit than they deserve. No amount of word making will ever make a single soul to know these mountains. As well, seek to warm the naked and frostbitten by lectures on caloric and pictures of flame. One day's exposure to mountains is better than cartloads of books. See how willingly nature poses herself on photographers' plates. No earthly chemicals are so sensitive as those of the human soul. All that is required is exposure and purity of material. The pure in heart shall see God. Let us celebrate the earth and our part in it. Amen.
muted. I'm Sharon Peterson. I'm an elder here at Summit Avenue, and we're going to have some prayers of the people. Family of faith, having heard the word read, let us turn our hearts to engage in creative of the people. To do so, I invite you to locate the green piece of paper that might be on your seat. Um, many of them are at the end of the pew, so you need to take one and then pass it down. And there's also probably pens or pencils there. You'll need those all. Everybody got their green paper and a pencil or a pen? There's going to be music playing, and while it plays, I want you to take a few minutes to write down a prayer. This will pertain to perhaps climate change or say change in our earth. It could be a prayer of gratitude, a part of Jesus that helps God's presence. It could be a prayer which has concerns for the earth. Personal prayer for wisdom to the climate crisis. Those of you who are at home and would like to participate in this, we invite you to add your, praise, your prayers to the chat, which is on your computer. There is no pressure to be eloquent here. All we ask is that you leave your prayer, that you write your prayer anonymously. Later in the service, we will exchange some of these anonymous written prayers so that we can be a community that is praying, praying with and for one another. But for now, I invite you to take a deep breath, put your feet on the floor, Center your feet and take a minute or two to write a prayer. Surely God is in this space. And remember, it should have something to do with God's creation, the concerns of the earth, or perhaps the wisdom and to respond and how we would do that to the climate crisis. We will now have some music while you write your prayer. During the offering, which will be when the uh, <laughs> basket comes down, the wagon comes down the middle of the thing, the aisle, and then um, during that time, 
after it has passed your pew, if you could please bring your prayers and put them in this basket on the little table. Okay? Okay, this will um, go from here. Around, after the closing of, of the benediction, everyone will be invited to draw a prayer from the basket. So what we're going to do is we're going to, when the basket is filled with all these prayers, I'm going to carry it out, and as you go out of the service, you can take one. Hopefully you won't get the same one, but there's lots of people here. So, and it's okay if you get the same one. You can pray about what you were thinking of. Family of faith, having listened and prayed, we now take a moment to think about how and what we can give. We know that it is not enough to simply think or feel our faith. We have to live it. We have to live it. After the wagon has passed down your row, we invite you to bring your prayer up to the table and place it in the basket. Let us give our prayers and our gifts to God. pray. Life giver and sustainer, our gratitude for you knows no end, from starry skies to purple sunsets, from weeping willows to beautiful butterflies, from babbling brooks to flitting hummingbirds. You have gifted us with so much. So today, as an act of gratitude, we draw close to you with both our prayers and our offerings. Creator God, only you know every prayer that has been written in this room. Only you can sift through these words and see all of us, our gratitude and our heartache. So take these prayers and guide our feet. 
Comfort where there is comfort needed. Celebrate where there is joy. Guide where there is fear. You know the prayers of our hearts, and for that we give you thanks. In addition to our written prayers, O God, we also give you our tithes and offering. And we pray, gracious creator, that you might use these tithes, offering, and loose change for your creation. Not a day goes by, but by when we do not fret about the state of this planet. Use our gifts to do some good here. With full hearts and hopeful spirits, we give, we pray, we turn it all over to you. Amen. Now, as you leave this place, may your heart swell for the beauty of this earth. May it break for the suffering of creation. May you burn with the conviction to do something about it. And may you always be aware of the holy ground beneath your feet. In the name of the creator, the created, and the source of creativity, go in peace and do the good that is yours to do. Amen.